the elders had asked some time ago to present some lessons dealing with Catholicism. It's a subject that certainly affects us in Arkansas, but not as much as in other places. And perhaps in Arkansas, we don't appreciate how much influence Catholicism has on our nation. If you watch television, you see a lot of influence implied. I was rather disturbed in the last few weeks as I watched the strong implications regarding Catholicism that was uh, a starring role in uh, some of the very important uh, or, or very popular shows, uh, uh, police shows that we see on TV. And certainly we see that uh, when, when you see church represented uh, in the movie industry most often, it's Catholicism, certainly a disproportionate influence. We need to prepare ourselves and understand. A lot of uh, the focus in Catholicism involves Mary. And that has become more the case in the last 20, the last 10, maybe even the last five years. Um, it's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> And I think that may be clear as we proceed with our lesson this evening. What should we think about Mary? What is the era that is taught about Mary? And how do we teach the truth to our friends who are mistaken? Will be the focus of our subject this evening. Under the, the heading of Mariology, a fancy sounding word that basically talks about the study of Mary. Mary is not the most important, not even a most important person in the New Testament in terms of influential people. She'd be, I think, pretty well down the line in terms of influence, though that's not the implication you get from Catholicism. The important verses that describe Mary are found uh, in Luke 1. Six month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Uh, verse 28 says, Coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And this tells us that she was favored of God more than all doesn't say that, uh, but she was favored. She was greatly troubled in this statement, kept pondering what kind of sal uh, salutation this might be, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. In verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You will name him Jesus. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the holy offering shall be called the Son of God. And that's the majority of the important portions of the Bible that, uh, that refer to Mary. She's mentioned elsewhere, as we'll see. Uh, but again, that's not the impression that you get. Mary is, I believe, worshipped, and uh, I think that statement is justified, though that's not going to be our focus this evening. We want to study what the Catholics describe as Mariology, and it falls under four different categories, as we'll see. There was an interesting article <clears throat> emphasizing the influence of the Catholic thinking in Time magazine a few years ago, raising the question, handmade or feminist? Well, we know about the feminist movement, and Mary doesn't really seem to fit into that if you know what the Bible says, but that's not the way the Catholics are teaching it. 
Among all the women who've ever lived, the mother of Jesus is the most celebrated, the most venerated, the most portrayed, the most honored in naming girl babies in churches. All from what we just read? I don't think so. Even the Quran praises her chastity and faith. And that's kind of true. Though Muhammad, in <clears throat> mentioning Mary, uh, demonstrates the fact that he was a lousy Bible student. Uh, he made her the sister of Moses. And some of the Islam apologists have said, no, no, this was a different Mary. And both of them had brothers named Moses and Aaron, but <laughs> it was a different Mary. He had time travel involved in his stories of the Bible on a number of occasions. Naaman was uh, a very important feature in the government of Pharaoh, not, not of Persia and Ahasuerus associated with Esther. But he didn't, he didn't read, and uh, that shows as he represents the Old Testament. Among Roman Catholics, the Madonna is recognized not only as the mother of God. Now, that's more than just the mother of the child, Christ. That's of God. But also, according to modern popes, queen of the universe. Wow, that really is in addition to what we were reading just a moment ago, isn't it? Queen of heaven seat of wisdom, and even the spouse of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is Mariology in the fullest sense. Ligori, who is one of the representatives of the Catholic Church, under the chapter, The Glories of Mary, says, at the command of Mary, all obey, even God. Does that what sound like what we read just a moment ago? Uh, she is omnipotent for the queen, according to all laws, enjoys the same privileges as the king. And she's the queen, and so they, they've got the same power, you see. She's omnipotent. Since the son's power also belongs to the mother, this mother is made omnipotent by an omnipotent son. And this is not just an uh, oddball. This is one of the church fathers, doctor of the church, we see is the subheading here in his recent book. And it's also pointed out by Time magazine that when uh, Pope John Paul was made bishop, this is before he was pope, we see his attitude displayed and he emblazoned a golden M on his coat of arms to choose as his Latin motto, totus tulus, all yours, referring to Mary, not to Christ. I'm all yours, not Christ, but Mary. Now this, this is far beyond what people who read the Bible imagine. It's just almost unbelievable to refer, all right, here's Mary, who's Christ, I'm all yours, but not to Christ, a Christian. This was when he was made Pope. John Paul made Mary a unifying power as a centerpiece of his papal arsenal. He has visited countless Marian shrines during his globetrotting and invokes Madonna's aid in nearly every discourse and prayer. But a much more aggressive view of Mary is emerging. Now, that's a scary statement, isn't it? after having described her as the queen of the universe, now then a more aggressive view is emerging. God has to obey her. More it, from the feminist circles within the church, emphasizing her autonomy, her independence, and her earthiness. Okay. The truth is Mary is never mentioned in any New Testament epistle and mentioned only four times after Jesus began to preach. It's mostly what we just read when the angel announced that she was going to bring into this world the
the Son of God. Looking at those instances, the four instances where she is mentioned after Christ began, not, not in the epistles at all. She's mentioned at the wedding feast and there he's, she's kind of goading Christ, it would appear. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to a woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. He's a little aggravated that she's pushing him. But his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And so he proceeds and provides this first evidence of the fact that he is truly the Son of God. That's the first example of four. At Capernaum, Jesus is teaching the crowd, the multitude, and uh, makes a very important observation about the relative importance of his mother. The multitude was sitting around him and said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Now here are all of his brothers in the more general sense, as he'll point out, and then another sense more important. But obviously their mothers and his mother and his brother in a very special sense is there. And so they point that out to him. And answering he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around on those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mothers, my brothers. These are the more important mothers and brothers. Almost a slight to it. I mean, some mothers would have got their feelings hurt with. But he was emphasizing a spiritual truth and the importance of the spiritual over the physical. And then we see her at the scene on the cross. The soldiers did these things, but there were standing by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary. Did you know Mary had a sister named Mary? His other sister. Okay. Wife, Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Behold your son. Woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. And so he basically turns his mother over to John as he's leaving and uh, fulfills his responsibility to look after her as best he can. And then the fourth time and last time we see Mary mentioned is at the upper room in Acts chapter 1. After these things with one mind, they were continually devoting themselves to prayer and among whom with the women... Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. The brothers had not believed on him. Now then, they do. And Mary is with them. Now that's the Bible picture. Nothing in the epistles, four times mentioned after Christ begins to preach. Very important role of bringing the Messiah into the world, favored and honored in that respect. But, Above those who honor and respect God, Jesus says, no, those are really his brothers and his mother. But in Roman Catholic Mariology, there are four dogmas that elevate Mary to the queen of the universe. She is, it begins with the Immaculate Conception, and then the Perpetual Virginity, the Mother of God, and the Assumption. And though if you look up Mariology, those are the four main points. A fifth point has developed that we'll look at briefly. Well, let's look at each of these and see if we can understand what they teach and then what the Bible teaches. The Immaculate Conception is often misunderstood. It's not that she conceived Jesus immaculately. It's not about the conception. It's about her conception. When she was born, Mary was born sinless because 
of inherited sin, she had to have some kind of protection to produce someone who was sinless. She has to be protected. Well, in order for her to be produced sinless so she can produce someone sinless, doesn't the one who produced her have to be How can you go back one step and not another and another? It, it's, it's a logical inconsistency. But the idea stems from the, uh, the concept of inherited sin, and Jesus has to be protected from that, and so you go a step back from him to Mary, and she has to be born without sin, which nobody else does. Uh, everybody else inherits. <clears throat> Carl Keating is one of the promoters of Catholicism, here defending against the attack <clears throat> of fundamentalists who... Uh, basically just read the Bible. <clears throat> the Immaculate Conception, he says, means that Mary, whose conception was brought about in a normal way, was conceived in the womb of her mother without the stain of original sin. So that Jesus could be produced without the stain of original sin. And so since Jesus had to be produced by someone without original sin, in order to be produced without original sin, why wouldn't Mary have to be <laughs> produced by someone without original. Anyway, that's the thinking. The essence of original sin consists in the lack of sanctifying grace. Mary was preserved from this defect. From the first instant of her existence, she was in the state of sanctifying grace. Well, that's, that's nice. Uh, mm, I'd like to have that. <laughs> God is no respecter of persons, but yeah, he did here. He, this is a special respecter of persons instance. The first of these defects was, of course, the original sin. Adam's children, we're all Adam's children, and of course she is as well, were born without grace and all inherited other evils as well. Now, we've studied that with respect to Calvinism, but Calvin um, rebelled against some of the evils of Catholicism. He didn't get rid of all of them. He inherited this fallacy from Catholicism, which he kept, unfortunately. It has been reaffirmed and made very obvious, just so it could be clarified, by Pope Pius IX. Uh, back in the 1800s, he solemnly declared the dogma of immaculate conception. And so that's the one who gets credit for making this declared, I guess, in 1854, which is a little late to have begun with Christ or in the New Testament times. What, what do we think about inherited sin? Can you inherit sin? What is sin? Sin is the violation of the law. We read in First John. We had a lesson on that, what, two Sundays ago. Uh, understanding what sin is tells you this is something that you do that you don't inherit. Either you do it or you don't do it. But inherit it? Is that possible? This is exactly what Ezekiel was talking about. We talked about in our class earlier. When he says, what do you mean using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? What, what do you mean? This, this is a bad proverb. As I live, declares the Lord, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Why? Because it teaches something that's wrong. Well, what's wrong? The person who sins will die. You, you do it and you are separated from God spiritually. Who? Not the one who inherits it, the one who does it. The son will not. Now this is so deep and theological, it's hard to understand. <laughs> and, and you hear the snickers here. That, that's ridiculous. The son will not bear the iniquity for the father's iniquity, uh, the punishment for the father's iniquity. Now, he can't inherit his father's sin. It's the one who sins. But he can inherit Adam's sin. Maybe you can follow that. I think that's 
obviously nonsense. Ezekiel said, this is not so. Don't use this proverb because it's wrong. It teaches something that's wrong. The truth is that Mary was a favored person, but Mary was a sinner. Luke 1, Mary said, My soul exalts in the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, why does God need to be her Savior? Because she's lost. That's necessarily implied. Verse 48, he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave and refers there in the next verse to his mercy that she enjoys with this generation. Romans 3 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see one exception very clearly made of that in 1 Peter 2. Christ left us an example who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Do we find any statements like that regarding Mary? No, she is thanking God for being her Savior. Jesus didn't say that, nor was a statement like this made of Mary. The heart of the era regarding the Immaculate Conception is the era of inherited sin. And it's not something you inherit, it's something that either you do or you don't do. Together with the other logical fallacies of the uh, implications of having a, to avoid inheritance by going back one step instead of infinitely far back. The next point in official Mariology is called perpetual virginity. The idea that she remained a virgin till the day she died began in mid-2nd century and was instigated, and the earliest instance we can find of it is in Proto-Evangelism of James. This is a book that goes back to the mid-2nd century. That's pretty far back, but it's not the 1st century. That's close, but as we pointed out, we're not playing horseshoes here. This, this is not close enough to being uh, a New Testament book. It was an obvious forgery and was condemned by the early church fathers. And all you have to do is read it. Uh, that's really all you have to do. There's some wild, crazy things in it that most people don't want you to know is there that try to promote it. Um, but the fact that it was mid-2nd century is enough for most people. It had nothing to do with James. The fact that James died, didn't he? When? in the first century, and we read about that, means that somebody claiming to be him in mid-second century is a forge, forger, and this is a forgery. Keating says, a careful look at the New Testament shows Mary kept her vow. That's an amazing statement. How many of you know where in the New Testament it says anything about Mary's vow to be a virgin? A careful look at the New Testament shows Mary kept her vow. I, I don't think that's where he got that. Never had any children other than Jesus. You carefully look at the New Testament and that's what you see. You, know, you have to carefully look at something besides the New Testament to see that. As we read in Time Magazine article, the Catholic and Orthodox traditions 15 centuries old, not 20 centuries old, <laughs> not old enough to be first century, holds that Mary was ever virgin, meaning that she and Joseph never had sex. And the brothers of Jesus mentioned the Bible were cousins because, and wave your hands real big, <laughs> I say so. Uh, in remote instances, that is a possible meaning, but it's certainly not the primary meaning, nor is it implied by any translator, including the Catholic translations. But in the Catholic Encyclopedia, we read, accusation has been made by many rationalists. <laughs> if you just read the Bible and say, well, it says brothers, I think that's what it means. You're a rationalist. Accusation has been made by many rationalists and others attacking the perpetual virginity of Mary because reference to the Gospels, in reference to the Gospels of the Brethren, uh, 
to the brethren of our Lord. The reference denotes solely a group of cousins. Because I say so. It's clear from the Gospels that Mary kept her resolve and had no children other than uh, after the virginal birth of Christ. It's clear from the Gospels. Now, where in the Gospels? It's clear. Just wave your hands big when you say that. Uh, Bill O'Reilly is an interesting character. He's obviously a Catholic and has promoted Catholicism, and especially in his book, Killing Jesus, though he uh, has promoted atheism and a good portion of it and makes it very obvious he does not believe the New Testament and says so. Uh, this doesn't make sense, so he doesn't believe that. and says that about several things in the New Testament. But he's explaining this problem. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Uh, well, many people lived with them at the time. If you were in that circumstance, everyone in your dwelling was referred to as a brother or sister everyone, but that doesn't mean they were biological. They, they lived in a commune, and all in the commune were brothers and sisters. Now, O'Reilly knows the importance as a journalist of having sources and making, uh, finding references for what he says. You won't find a reference quoted here, and not only will you not find it in the book, you won't find it elsewhere either. Uh, Jesus grew up in a commune, you think? <laughs> it helps the Catholic position, and that's where it comes from. In the past, some have written that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but there's no evidence of that. Well, let's just check the reference. Here in Matthew 13, the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to explain Christ, and they acknowledged is he not the carpenter's son? It is not his mother named Mary. His brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, are not his sisters with me. There's no reference for that in the New Testament, according to O'Reilly. Well, and by the way, this is from the New American Bible. That's the Catholic version. They didn't have the temerity to call it cousins. In Matthew 1, again from the Catholic Bible, he had no relations with her until he bore a son named, uh, and he named him Jesus. Now that may not logically compel us to think he continued to have no relations. Uh, he did have relations afterwards, but it certainly implies he, he had none until, and, and it would imply that went that far and no further. Back to Keating. It's traditional in the conclusion of the wedding ceremony for the bride to take a bouquet to a side altar and lay it at the feet of the statue of the Virgin, at the same time praying that she might emulate Mary as a wife. I, the Mary they describe wouldn't make a very good wife. In fact, she'd be in rebellion to the teaching of the New Testament. This marriage would be a rebellion. It would be a horrible example according to the instructions of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7 here, reading from the New English translation, which I think is an excellent translation. The husband should give his wife her sexual rights and likewise a wife to her husband. Mary never did that, according to the Catholics. I think she did. I think she was a good wife. Uh, it is not the wife who has the right to her own body, but the husband, the same way. Uh, it is not the husband who has rights to his own body, but the wife. Do not deprive each other. But according to the Catholics, she deprived all of her life. She took rights that were not hers. Um, but you lay the bouquet at her feet and say, I want to be a good wife like Mary. That, that's mind-boggling. They don't understand what the Hebrew writer was saying. Say, marriage is to be held in honor among all, 
and the marriage bed undefiled, they don't honor it. You're more honorable to be like Mary, would be the implication. And you can imagine what kind of problems that causes in the marriage. It's interesting to notice the observation of the International, uh, the, uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which often is favorable to Catholic positions, but here seems to draw the line. If Mary was married to Joseph, and Joseph to Mary in appearance only, then uh, they were recreant to each other and to the ordinance of God, which made them one. They, they just refused the ordinance of God. How a Roman Catholic to whom marriage is a sacrament can entertain such a notion is an unfathomable mystery. I find myself in agreement with that. Back of this unwholesome dogma are two utterly false ideas that the marriage relationship is incompatible with holy living and that seems to be part of what's underlying it. She was holy. Now then these who come after her who don't maintain uh, her purity once they're married. They're not as holy as Mary. And Mary is not to be considered a human being under ordinary obligations of human life. She's different. Well, different in that she's the mother of God. The next main heading. This was conferred at the Third Ecumenical Council in 431 AD in Ephesus, according to the Catholics themselves didn't start in the first century. And the mother of God is, is again, more than the mother of Jesus, uh, the physical son, but of God. Now, everybody knew she was the mother of Jesus. She bore him, but of God? That, uh, that's a considerable step above, which she didn't get until four. Uh, 31 AD. We compare that with John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Mary wasn't in the beginning with God. But the Word was. And the Word became flesh. But she wasn't the mother of God. God, Christ, was in the beginning with God the Father. She wasn't anywhere around. And so the idea she's the mother of God is just not so. She wasn't with God in the beginning. She was not the mother of God. The Bible doesn't say so. That's Catholic tradition added hundreds of years after the New Testament. And then there is the assumption of Mary, which is the last point of the Mariology. Wikipedia describes this. The Catholic Church teaches as dogma that the Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed bodily and soul into heaven of glory. This doctrine was dogmatically defined by Pope Pius XII on November the 1st, 1950. That's a little after the first century. <laughs> um, they had taught it before, but where is it in the New Testament? Yeah, they have no idea. In fact, some of them, Keating of all people, readily acknowledges this. Fundamentalists ask these terrible people who want to know where it is in the Bible. Where's the proof? From Scripture, strictly, he says, there is none. Now, why would he just barefacedly say, it's not in the Bible? The mere fact that the church teaches the doctrine of the assumption as something definitely true, I'm sorry, is guarantee that it is true. I get that prematurely. But he says it's not in the Bible. The fact the church says it is all you need. Whereas in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
Paul says, abide in the things you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned it. Where did it come from? It didn't come from Christ. It didn't come from the inspired apostles. It came from Pope Pius XII in 1950, officially. Uh, not from the Bible, but from the apostate church. He continues to say, from a babe you've known the sacred writings. That's where it should come from. Make sure you know where it came from. But Pope Paul II described Mary, and this is what, what's now the, the, the fifth step that's been added, sometimes called high Mariology. Pope Paul II described Mary as a mediatrix and a co-redemptress. Redemptrix. Those are strange sounding words. They're certainly not biblical words. Mediatrix means that as a woman, she is mediator. And she is redeemer. Redeemer and mediator. An advocate, according to this book that was recently published about Mary and her role. Uh, from Newsweek, we read, this is what theolog theologians call high Mariology. And they acknowledge, though they are strongly influenced by Catholicism, it seems to contradict the basic New Testament belief that there's one God and one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. One mediator. But she is co-mediatrix <laughs> and co-redeemer. Uh, in fact, Newsweek makes an interesting observation. In place of the Holy Trinity, it would appear there would be a kind of holy quartet. Now, that has been manufactured by the Catholic Church. And that's not an exaggeration. Notice LaCorey's description. Mary is the ark which saves from eternal destruction anyone who takes shelter in it. Now, we've seen the ark as an antitype, uh, the, the type antitype relationship between Christ and the ark, which is... I think readily acknowledged. In the great deluge, even beasts were saved in Noah's ark under the shelter of Mary. Even sinners are saved. So she's the co-redemptrix. Uh, well, there's one. And we're complete in him. I think we can see fallacies in each of these five points of Mariology and then the high Mariology. And I will conclude with an observation and a few points afterwards. Based on Luke chapter 11 where people were praising Mary as he is on his way to the cross. It came about while he said these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breast at which you were nursed. Blessed be Mary. And that's what we hear in a very special way from the Catholics. He said, on the contrary. Hmm. <laughs> that's different. It's Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it as he implied when they said, your mother is outside, and he said, no, you are my mother and my brothers. Those who hear the word and observe it are more important than the physical relationships. Jesus reaffirms that here. If you want to be brother to Christ, you can be. My mother, my brothers, are these who hear the word of God and do it. Notice also Keating's statement. Remember that in this word, you're tossed about on a stormy sea. This is a figure we see in Scripture. Uh, you're lost, you're tossed, you're lost at sea without an anchor. You're not walking on solid ground. You don't want to be lost at sea. What's the solution? You must keep your eyes fixed on the bright star and call on Mary. That's the way... You keep from being lost at sea. 
you can't help but know that he remembers in the back of his mind at least Hebrews 12, keep your eyes on Christ, on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. No, no, you cross that out and you put Mary in its place. And she's the one that can save you. Colossians 2 says, in him you have been made complete. And he is head over all rule and authority. Not co-redeemer or advocate. Uh, but we're complete in him. The idea of Mariology is false doctrine. And it substitutes the human for the divine. And we must see that era and oppose it. If you're not a brother of Christ or a sister of Christ, you can be. And he invites you to that relationship through obedience. We extend to you this evening his invitation to confess, to repent, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins according to his authority. And he will save you from all the stormy seas and from your sins. And we encourage you to do that while we stand together and sing.